fear and worry, but we should just trust him and turn our eyes to him. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, we're going to read one verse as our text and then pray and see what the Lord has for us tonight. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to keep our heart. I'm thankful for the word of God that so often presents very simple, direct commands that we can easily understand, and really it just comes down to will we choose to obey it or not. I pray that you would help us to obey this. Help us to take this lesson in and ponder it and apply it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of the message is Keep Your Heart. Keep Your Heart. And that's, uh, that's what this verse begins uh, in saying. It says, Keep Thy Heart with all diligence. Many of us have probably memorized this verse. We know this very well. We understand it's the, the, the point, the gist. You read it once, okay, I got it. And yet when we ponder it, I think its profound depth should really make an impression on us. This word keep, uh, there are close to 30 definitions in Webster's Dictionary to the word keep. And I won't read all of them for you. But it's a very deep and broad word. It means a lot of things that are very similar to each other. Keep, to hold, to retain in one's power or possession. To have in custody for security or preservation. To preserve, to retain, to protect, to guard or sustain. To hold or restrain from departure. To detain to tend, to feed, to maintain, to hold in one's own bosom. It's a, it's a, very, a very nuanced word, and there's a lot here, and a lot goes into keeping one's heart, to protect it, to tend to it, to maintain it, to, to guard it, to keep it from wandering away. As an illustration, try going to Mall of America on a busy day with small children and try to keep your children. And you'll understand that keeping your heart is a very similarly complicated task. With crowds of people and you're there all day, you've got to feed them, you have to take them to the bathroom, you've got to change diapers, you've got to keep them entertained, and you've got to watch out for strangers who might have... Uh, negative intentions, all of these things, there's a lot there that has to do with keeping our heart, protecting it, providing for it, guarding it, watching out for it. Keep thy heart with all diligence. The word diligence means steady application in business of any kind. Continuing on, constant effort to accomplish what is undertaken. Constant effort. Exertion of body or mind without unnecessary delay or sloth. Due attention. Care. Heed. Heedfulness. Diligence. We understand what diligence is. And hard work usually uh, requires and includes diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Don't don't slack in diligence. Don't don't, uh, leave any diligence unapplied in keeping your heart. And we might say, well, this sounds like a lot of work to keep your heart with all diligence. What's the point of this? Well, the verse tells tells us uh, what the point is. For out of it are the issues of life. The word for tells us this is why. Keep thy heart with all diligence for, and here's the answer, here's the explanation, out of it your heart produces something. Your heart emanates something. There is something that comes out of your heart that is very impactful. Out of it are the issues. The word issues means, and we use the word a little bit differently now, but the word issues means the act of passing or flowing out. 
it issues from something. A sending out, an issuing, a sending out, uh, an event, an issue is an event or a consequence, an end or ultimate result. We would say water issues from the faucet when you turn it on. Smoke issues from fire. It comes out of it. It, 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 it sends out from it. For out of it, out of your heart, are the issues of life, the things that ha come to pass in life, the things that, that issue from life and to life in, in our lives come from our heart. What does your heart send out? What are the things that issue from your heart? I think it's, it's important to notice that these issues of life are the things that, as I said, determine your life. They guide your life. They, they decide how your story ends in a lot of ways. Your surroundings don't guide your life. Your friends don't guard your, uh, guide your life. The era in which you live do not determine how your life turns out. Those are circumstances, and we don't control those things a lot of times. We don't control, uh, you know, the, the medical technology, for instance. A lot of people died sooner uh, at an earlier age because they didn't have good medical technology that we have now. People can live longer, but those things do not determine your life. The issues of life come from your heart. The issues of your heart, and so we ought to keep it. It's important. We must keep our hearts with all diligence. Turn over to Matthew chapter 15. And we see a very clear example of this. Matthew 15. This is the command. This is the injunction. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. If you want your life to go right, to go in a good direction, maybe not uh, if you want to create a, a detailed plan for how everything in your life should go, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking generally, do you want your life to turn out for eternal good or eternal evil? Do you want God to be pleased with your life or displeased with your life? It comes back to keeping your heart with all diligence. Matthew 15, verse 1, it says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. He's saying, Let's talk about traditions. Your tradition is you don't have to, to give uh, your money to your parents to help support them in their time of need. You can give it to the temple instead and, and, and fail, re, uh, refuse to, to help your, to honor your parents in this way. This is your tradition, but you are, as he says in verse 6, thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. It, let's talk about traditions. Let's talk about breaking the traditions. God's tra or your tradition breaks the commandments of God. Washing your hands, okay, that violates your tradition, but your traditions are not the same as God's commands. Verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended <laughs> after they heard this saying? I don't know that he did or not, but it, I imagine a little bit of a smile on his face. Yes, yes, I knew that. I was well aware, but verse 13, but he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, 
false witness, blasphemies, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. This is the point. This is why it's so important to keep your heart, because out of your heart come the things that can defile you and me. Protect that. Guard that. I want to talk about the failure to keep our heart for a few minutes. I don't normally use object lessons when I preach, but I'm going to use one tonight. And no, teenagers, don't get your hopes up. I don't know that this will be a regular thing. But I hope to make a point to show you how we can fail to keep our heart and the effects that it has. I have here a pitcher of water, and it's straight out of the tap, so it's safe to drink. And if we were to go around with that and fill up cups, you would all be able to drink from it, and it would taste just like water to you. And that's how God wants it to be in our heart. He wants our heart to be pure. Because the issues that come out of it, he wants to be pleasing to him and honoring him. But too often, if we don't guard our heart, other things will happen and it won't be what it ought to be. I have some other things here as illustrations. Now, all of these um, additives are not going to change the color of the water. I think we would all understand pretty easily how pollution works if we discolor the water. But I'm speaking primarily to Christians tonight. And if you've been in church very long, if you've heard the Bible preach very long, you understand the pollution that is out there in the world. The vices, the, the substances, the behaviors... And you can even identify them on the faces of people in the world sometimes. You can see how sin has wasted their body. And you can just look at them and say, they're probably in such and such a behavior. And that, that, is, that is very sad. And it's very visible and obvious. And we know better than that. And by God's grace, we won't end up there. But you and I still need to guard our hearts. And we can fail to guard our hearts and yet still keep up a facade where it's not apparent that we have not guarded our hearts. There are things going on. Everything looks fine. It looks clean and pure, but it's not that way. And so I've chosen additives here that won't change the color of the water. In Proverbs 4.23, we read the, the Proverbs were given by Solomon to his son. He had all the blessings that earthly life could offer. Um, wealth and wisdom from his parents. He was brought up in Judaism. And yet Solomon told him, guard your heart. We can dress and act and talk the right way. And unless a person gets a look into our heart, they won't see the defilement that's truly there. But I want to demonstrate a few things and just use them as pictures. They, these are not all the issues of, of the heart that will come up. There is, these are not all the problems that we might deal with. These are just a few, but I, I think it'll make the point. First of all, I have here in this bowl common table salt. So I'll pour it in there and I'll stir this up. And you can imagine what it's going to taste like. Probably none of us would want to um, drink it at this point. Um, we probably could handle it, but it wouldn't be very delicious. And as that dissolves, you can see it becomes invisible. And for the purpose of the illustration, I'd like to use salt as a picture of anger. We can become angry people, and we even have a phrase, you know, they're, they're a little bit salty about it. They're upset. They're angry. And we can have anger in our hearts. And we haven't guarded our heart from anger. It's there, but we just do a good job of covering it up. And we can even justify it. 
Well, it's okay. I, I should be angry at the wrong kinds of things. I mean, salt is good for, for some things. We use salt intentionally. And so we can say, well, I mean, anger isn't always bad. Just look at this, and then we justify it. But I think it's interesting to think it's easier to misuse salt in a, in a, in a, on, the, on the dinner table. It's easier to, to misuse salt than it is to, to use it properly. It's easier to get too much salt than anything. If you ever use a shaker and the lid comes off, your whole plate's ruined. It's easy to let something like anger get out of control. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. See, anger's good. Well, yes, there, not just all anger is sin automatically, but let's look at what the Bible continues to say about anger. Uh, James 1.19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Matthew 5.22 says, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall um, be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council. God takes anger very seriously. Proverbs 19.11 says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Proverbs 14.29, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. Psalm 37, 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Anger is not always sin. I'm not saying that. Every time you feel anger, that's automatically sin. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we easily go too far. We easily are angry at the wrong things. And we can do a good job of hiding it. See, I'm not angry. But just have a taste and you'll see. You'll see what's there. Next, I have cream of tartar, and I'm going to put that in, stir that up. If you've ever had cream of tartar all by itself, you wouldn't be looking forward to a sip of water right now. Cream of tartar has an acidic, biting flavor, and I'll use it as a picture of pride or another angle of pride, which would be faithlessness. I refuse to trust God because I trust my assessment of the situation more than I trust what God has said. I don't think God's in control. I know he said he is, but I'm looking at what's going on right now, and I'm deciding God's not actually in control. I'm trusting my opinion of the situation. These heart problems are connected to each other, pride and faithlessness. Um, of course, we use cream of tartar in baking. It has its purpose. See, there's, there's a, we might be able to justify it, and that's what I want to keep bringing up, we can justify these things. We can call something like pride, well, it's just self-confidence. Um, I'm not faithless, I'm just being realistic. I'm not proud, I'm self-reliant. Um, I'm not being faithless, I'm just using prudence. I'm looking at the situation and, and we can try to justify it. Of course, pride is condemned repeatedly in the Bible. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, and the first one is a proud look. Proverbs 13, 10 says, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Jeremiah 48, 29 gives a very bad example of someone who is very proud. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceeding proud. His loftiness and his arrogancy and his pride and the haughtiness of his heart. You and I have all met people who have been proud. We've been people who are proud. And we can do a good job of hiding it sometimes. Oh, I'm, you know, we can, even false humility, inverted pride, and we're so humble, we're so quick to say, I am nothing, but it's actually pride masquerading. And it looks, it looks real pure. This water looks nice and clean, but you wouldn't want a taste of that. We didn't guard our heart. James 4, 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Talking about faithlessness, Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith. 
But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And we have to guard our heart against things like this. Because you know what? There are plenty of instances, plenty of times in our life where we'll be, we will be encouraged to be angry. That, I can't believe that happened. Plenty of times that we will be encouraged to be angry. We'll be tempted to be angry. There are plenty of times where we'll be tempted to lift ourselves up in pride. Where we'll be tempted to, to, to believe our eyes instead of believe God and be faithless. 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in f- spirit, in faith, in purity. We can hide it pretty well sometimes, but what's in our heart defiles us. Next, I have some vinegar here, some white vinegar. And I'll pour some of that in there. You wouldn't even know it. It blends right in. But again, you wouldn't want any of this. I don't even like the smell of it. I'm going to use vinegar as a picture of cynicism. And and I'll put sarcasm in there as well. Vinegar, as we know, can be used effectively for cleaning. You you even include it in cooking and, and foods. But it's caustic. I found it interesting to find out that over time, vinegar, white vinegar can slowly etch and eat away at natural stone, like marble and limestone. It can eat away at that. It's caustic. And cynicism and sarcasm are caustic in our lives. The cynics were an ancient sect of philosophers who valued themselves on their contempt of riches and of arts and sciences and amusements. And so the word cynic comes from that, and it's not a very complimentary definition. Cynic, having the qualities of a surly dog, snarling, captious, surly, currish, austere. To be cynical means uh, it's talking about moroseness, contempt of riches and amusements. And often we use cynical as yeah, yeah, it's not as good as it looks. Don't, I can see what's beneath that, and there can be some pride in there. But it's caustic, it's, it's, it's angry, it's all of these things. And, and we can excuse it in our lives. We can even laugh it off. But we're cynical. Sarcasm. The word sarcasm uh, means to deride or sneer at. Primarily to flay or pluck off the skin very graphic description of what is happening emotionally and figuratively when we, when we employ sarcasm. It's a keen, reproachful expression, a satirical remark or expression uttered with some degree of scorn or contempt, a taunt, a jibe. That's what sarcasm is. And it's just, it, it's destructive. It's very caustic. And we can laugh it off. It's, I'm just joking. I'm just, it's just a joke. Lighten up. But these very caustic attitudes can come when we do not guard our heart. Ephesians 4.29 tells us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Where does com- corrupt communication start? In our heart. So if it's coming out our mouth, it's defiling us, and it starts in our heart. And so if that's what's coming out, we can say, I did not guard my heart. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You have to guard your heart, otherwise gracious words will not come out of your mouth. Romans 14, 19 says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. That takes diligence. Guard thy heart, keep thy heart with all diligence. 1 Timothy 1, 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. So fables, genealogies, that's different from sarcasm and all this, but the point is, Let's focus on godly edifying. That's where our focus needs to be. Don't get distracted on anything else. Godly edification. Well, it's just that I didn't really mean it. 
well, then it shouldn't come out of our mouths. I also have 91% rubbing alcohol. It's not a beverage, okay? We understand this. And maybe there's, there would be a, a tough guy who would want to take a sip at this at the end, but because I put that in there, you can't have one. But you don't see it, do you? It looks like pure water to me. I'm going to use this as a picture of a critical spirit. Again, rubbing alcohol has its uses. It sanitizes. It disinfects. Um, if you have to use a, an insulin needle, perhaps, uh, you, would be, you would do well to rub your skin with it to disinfect the area. If you're going to be uh, sanitizing uh, surgical instruments, they use rubbing alcohol for things like that. But a critical spirit defiles the life. And we can justify a critical spirit and say, well, I'm, I'm just examining fruit. I'm, I'm just identifying uh, issues here, but it, it's actually a critical spirit. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be discerning. I'm saying we can take it too far and it becomes a critical spirit. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. That's what a critical spirit does. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. And again, these are just a few examples of things that can find their way into our heart if we don't guard it, if we're not vigilant, like a watchman on the wall, guarding and keeping and protecting and preserving and tending. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. And the world might use that and say, don't try to discern anything. Don't try to identify sin or identify righteousness. And that's not what the Lord is saying. He's saying, don't have a critical spirit. Don't, don't be quick to judge and pass judgment. Verse 2, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. The, the punishment and the judgment you hand out is what you're going to receive. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Why would somebody, this is a figurative example, but why would somebody overlook the beam in their own eye because they see the mote in somebody, because they have a critical spirit. And if we don't guard our heart, and I'm using myself on purpose, including myself in that, if I don't guard my heart, if we don't guard our heart, we will end up with that sort of issue in our heart. Lastly, I have some baking soda. And we use baking soda quite regularly in cooking and in household uses. I don't think it's going to boil over. I tested it out first. The last thing I wanted was a big puddle on the floor. But it's noticeable at first, and then it'll go away. I believe it's carbon dioxide that's being created there. And I noticed it actually seemed to make the water look even more pure after it was done. But this is quite a quite a mixture of issues. I'm using baking soda, which has a salty and a bitter taste. I'm using it as a picture of bitterness. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, none of the issues I've men mentioned tonight are issues that, that I 
I don't have anybody in mind. I don't, I don't have anyone in mind. I'm not targeting anything. I'm just describing issues that we all have to deal with, problems that can find their way into our hearts. If we're honest, none of us would want a taste of that water. Yet when our heart is not guarded and tended, it will collect these things and more. Maybe just small amounts, little by little. I didn't really put all that much. If I'd put a lot more baking soda in with a lot more vinegar, it would have been boiling over and on the floor. But just small amounts. It's not that big. See, I controlled it. It's not that big a deal. You can't even tell now. It's not that, not that big of a problem. It all seems so minor. And when others look at us, they may not see those things at all. But when we dispense what is here, and that's why I included this ladle, because out of our heart are the issues of life. It's as though we go around giving other people sips of the water that's in our heart, and we take sips of the water that's in our heart. And we don't think it's a problem until it starts to have an effect when we dispense what is in our heart. It defiles us, and it defiles others. The issues of life that come from an unguarded heart are caustic and destructive and repulsive. It's kind of a sobering picture. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 4, and we might ask, well, how does it come in? How does it get into my heart? How, what do I guard? What do I, what, what, what gateways, what portals, what avenues do I watch? The context of Proverbs 4.23 includes some of these. Maybe we would say it includes every single one of them. Proverbs 4.20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil." So in verse 20, we see the ears. Verse 21, we see the eyes. We see the, the mouth and the lips in verse 24. We see the eyes again in verse 25. Ponder the path. That involves our thoughts. And in verse 27, we see actions. These are all ways that our heart can be affected. We listen to things. We watch things. We ponder things. Even what we say can change how we think. We, we let our words go unguarded. It can change our heart, our actions, our thoughts. This is how sin and defilement enters our heart. We have to be on guard. Even the saints can experience this sort of thing to our own shame. It doesn't have to be this way when the Holy Spirit is in control or in our life. It doesn't have to be this way. But if he's not in control, this is the sort of thing that we have. And so you might say, okay, well, I've got some of those issues. What do I do now? I didn't guard my heart. Now, where does that leave me? Well, let's talk just briefly about how to cleanse our heart in life. What can be done if we have failed to guard our heart and keep our heart? I'm thankful that there is always hope with God. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. David's sin with Bathsheba was a horrible, wicked episode in David's life. And this is what David said in his repentance. Verse, Psalm 51, 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. God did cleanse him. He didn't save him from all the consequences of his sin, but he did cleanse him. 
1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 119, 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We need to humble ourselves and confess and repent and go to the word of God. It's the word that cleanses us. John 15, 3, Jesus says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is what cleanses us. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How do you cleanse your heart and life? How do you reverse course from failing to guard your heart? Will you fill your heart and mind with the words and the thoughts of God? You and, and I, I can't demonstrate it, but we take the word of God that is pure water, clean, not mixed with this wickedness, and we pour it in, and we keep flushing our life with it, keep overflowing, keep pouring in the pure word of God, cast out the sources of defilement that threaten our heart, and continually wash our mind and our heart by meditating and reading and memorizing the word of God, obeying it. It will change you, and you will be more and more repulsed at every flavor of sin that the world brings across your path. The closer you get to the Lord, the, the, the more sanctified and set apart from sin that you become and sanctified unto the Lord, the more you will notice when, when that comes back. Whatever it is that you could take any of those elements, just a taste, Ugh, let's get that out. I don't have a, I don't have an, a tolerance for that anymore. Develop an appetite for God. Psalm 34, 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. When we fail to keep our heart, we don't want a taste of that. We can taste and see that the Lord is good. May God help his people to become sweet to the taste like the Father so that others are blessed and not defiled. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's important. Let's keep our heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this very simple command, and I pray that you would help us to take it seriously. Lord, you know our hearts, and you know how easily we can be tempted and seduced and enticed to allow just just a little bit of these things in it's just it's just a little bit of anger it's just a little bit of bitterness it's it's not very much pride and before we know it our life is defiled and polluted help us to keep our heart help us to set up guards and walls that come straight from the word of god Help us to guard our ears and our eyes and our lips and our actions, our thoughts. Help us to put it all through the filter that is the Word of God for your pleasure and your glory so that we can keep our heart with all diligence and the issues of our life can bring glory to you and be according to your plan. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to consider these things tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll have a brief moment.